You're listening to the Based on History podcast. All units, Irene. I say again, Irene. And we're going to kick him in the ass. We're going to kick the hell out of him all the time. And we're going to go through him like crap through a goose. You tell him I'm coming. And hell's coming with me, you hear? Hell's coming with me. That they may take our lives. But they'll never take our freedom. Are you not entertained? Are you not entertained? Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to the Based on History podcast. I'm your host, John Nidick, as always, and today we're going to be trying something a little bit different and see how well it takes off and see if people enjoy it, and if it does, then I'll do more of these, but we'll call this a Based on History mini as well, but these ones are going to focus more on the weapons, armor, and tactics of the historical events that we see represented, usually terribly, in the movies that we discuss. And so we're just going to go right back to the beginning and talk about the weapons, armor, and tactics associated with the time period in the movie Braveheart. And we're not going to talk about every single weapon and every single piece of armor, but there are some things that I would like to talk about more in depth, and I know people that enjoy history more so than the people that just enjoy the movie aspect of the podcast enjoy hearing, enjoy talking, enjoy discussing these things about the weapons and the armor and the battles and, and, and all of those types of things. So I thought it would be cool to just pick a few things here and there to talk about. I don't want these to be super, super long. I want to be able to kind of crank out some of these uh, minis so that the content can kind of keep flowing in between the historical minis and the full episodes themselves. So let's just get started. First, we're going to talk about some of the weapons in the movie Braveheart and what they were really like in history and how accurately they were portrayed in the movie Braveheart. And the first one I want to talk about is the sword that you're going to see the most in that movie, and that's the British knightly sword. Some people refer to it as the arming sword or the knight sword. It it has different names throughout history, and historians and other people have gone in depth about what name applies to what sword and at what time period this name applied to this type of sword and if this type of sword does it have to have this shape or can you identify it just in this shape and there's all these different trains of thought to how to describe medieval and pre-medieval weapons and, and all of that. I am not a historian, so I am not going to jump into that side of the debate. Uh, that's for more educated people than myself, but we're just going to call it the British knightly sword. And it's a one-handed sword that looks more or less like what you would call a stereotypical medieval sword. It, you know, it's, it's like I said, it's one-handed. It has a tapered, thick blade. Usually there's a fuller in the middle of it. And this sword is what, in the movie, is generally carried by all of the English soldiers and a lot of the Scottish soldiers as well. And in real life, it would have been carried by everyone, you know, in England and Scotland and on the continent. It was a super popular sword at this time. And this knightly sword is a development from earlier Norman swords and in turn from Viking swords themselves. And if you laid these swords out on a table next to each other, you can see the evolution. You can see how we got from these early Viking swords to the Norman swords, to the knightly sword. The Viking sword is much broader all the way up to the tip. It's a little bit shorter. It's a one-handed with a very kind of tight one-handed grip. A lot of the Viking swords don't have a cross guard. They have a thick pommel, uh, um, you know, certain shapes that you can kind of identify as the Viking pommel, the Viking grip. And then you look at the Norman sword, and it's a little bit longer. The Normans are kind of proto-knights when they, you know, at the Battle of Hastings and their con 
conquest of England. And so they're on horseback. They need a little bit longer sword. And you see that evolution into the Norman period. And then when you look at this kind of early to mid medieval knightly sword, it looks just like the next step of this evolution of sword. It's a little bit longer. It's a little bit more tapered. They add the fuller in a lot of cases, and then they start adding cross guards. And this sword is a lot lighter than people would think. Some of these swords are three pounds, you know, roughly somewhere, somewhere in that. So you, you, it doesn't take a whole lot of force to wield the knightly sword. And that's one of the reasons why it was very popular. It's also fairly easy to make. They can crank these out for a lot of people. And then, of course, obviously, swords of this time vary in quality and construction and who the maker was and, and, and all that. So I'm not saying that they're all you know great swords. But generally speaking, pretty good steel in these swords. There's some pretty good ones that, that are in museums that are that have lasted, you know, stood the test of time, so to speak. And the next sword that I kind of want to talk about is William Wallace's sword specifically. And I hit on this briefly in the episode itself, but we're going to dig into it a little bit more. When you see William Wallace's sword, and the Scots in particular, you hear the word claymore a lot. And the word claymore is a Scottish word that generally refers to swords from a later time period. The sword that William Wallace supposedly would have used would have been called a great sword. And this is another one of those kind of ambiguous terms that historians argue about what what does great sword mean? What does broadsword mean? You know, that 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 kind of a thing. Now, it's said in Blind Harry's, you know, retelling that he used this massive sword and the sword at the William Wallace collection, you know, is like five feet, four inches. So it's a massive, massive sword. And there is some historical, there are some historical documents referring to William Wallace's sword specifically. And at later dates and times, people having the scabbard redone or the belt redone. So we know that William Wallace's sword did exist and was of some significant importance. But that being said, the sword that is at the William Wallace collection, we don't know if it's William Wallace's sword at all. Now, we can kind of play history detective and kind of figure some things out. Yes, he's reportedly to have used a really big sword. This is a really big sword, and it has changed hands throughout you know history, but hundreds and hundreds of years later than the William Wallace's lifetime. Now, the thing that really discredits the sword at the William Wallace collection is that they've done some testing on it, and the handle and the hilt and the pommel are all from much, much later. I mean, I'm trying to remember, but it's something like the 15th or 16th century. So they've, it, 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 that itself doesn't necessarily mean that it's not William Wallace's sword because in those historical records that we were just talking about, some of those, those things could have been replaced or redone at the very least to make the sword, you know, presentable of, of, of some kind. Because those things do wear out. Those, you know, those, a lot of handles are made out of wood. They're made out of leather. They're made out of perishable things. And William Wallace did a lot of fighting. So things could be worn down through battle and need to be replaced. The thing that really kind of discredits itself for it to being William Wallace's actual sword is the fact that this sword, as far as historians and the people that have done the testing on it can tell, it's made up of at least three different swords all coming from different periods of time. Now, the base of the sword near the hilt and the handle is estimated to be from the 13th century. So there is still hope that the sword in the Wallace collection could at least partly be the actual sword of William Wallace. And during those refitting of the belt and the scabbard and other things like that, maybe they just didn't record it and they also the, the sword was badly damaged and so they had to reforge it and add 
other pieces of steel from a later time to this sword to make it a presentable piece. But we don't know that. We don't know if it's just some random big sword that somebody found and reported it as William Wallace's sword, and then throughout history that's been lost, and now it's the William Wallace sword. We don't know. But on the other hand, it very well could be. We know that that sword itself has been passed down from this lord to that lord, and it was in you know their private collections and things like that. So they're... I'm not saying one way or the other, just kind of presenting the facts that we know about this sword. The sword in the movie is massive, and as far as the construction of it, the it's a little bit Hollywood, you know, all, all around. That's It's not terrible by any means. I'm sure there are some great swords that looked like that. But when you look at Scottish broadswords and Scottish two-handed swords and and great swords of that time, they they just look a little bit different. The cross guards are usually a little bit angled, and the handle's a little bit different. And that's not too big of a, of a big deal. Just kind of, just some thoughts on that. The next that we're going to be talking about is some of the armor in the movie as to the historical armor during the late 13th century and early 14th century. The armor in the movie... And I know that people listening to this are already thinking how bad the armor in the movie is. And it's bad. It's really, really bad. When we look at armor from that period of time and compare it to the movie, it's almost... I don't think the, they did any research whatsoever to even try and get historical authenticity for the film. It is plain and simple, bad movie armor. When we look at the, we'll look at the British first, and we'll talk about what they're wearing in the movie. In the movie, they're wearing these, like, plate, tiny plate armor jumpsuits, almost. And it's very uniform throughout. All of the British are wearing these kind of little... And they're not quite scales, but they're just these little plates that have been sewn together and make a whole jumpsuit. And what they could possibly be referring to is kind of that time period's coat of plates. But the coat of plates look nothing like what the British are wearing in in that in the movie. Now, what people would have been wearing, and you do see some of it, is mail. The knights and soldiers and sergeants of this time, especially in the British Army and and all throughout the medieval world, would have been wearing suits of mail. And these cover you from head to toe, and they're little links of, of metal that have been hammered into circles and then linked together to form this kind of armor suit. And regardless of what they're wearing on top of that, Almost all of them would have been wearing some form of mail. Now, when you when you look at what takes to get ready for battle, they're wearing their kind of clothing underneath, and then a layer of this, and then a layer of mail, and then another layer of this, and then padding for the helmet, and then, you know, it takes a lot to get ready for battle. Everyone in the movie looks like they've got one layer of armor on, and that's it. You can just tell that the it's just not there. The level's just not there. Mail in movies is always sporadic. It's never used enough. Now, don't get me wrong. There are some movies that do a better job of this than others. But when you look at movies as a whole, especially medieval movies, you see mail here, mail there. They're wearing one piece of mail and nothing else. It, it, that, that doesn't really do anything because... When, you get in, when you're getting into these big battles, all of these areas need to be covered in some way, shape, or form, especially during this time period when full-body coverage is coming, and not just coming, but is in prominence. So when you're portraying it in movies, you need to be aware of that. Now, like I said, the English are wearing full-body coverage, but it's completely wrong. Now, we'll talk about the coat of plates for a little bit, because I... This is a kind of a lesser known type of armor. You don't see it well represented in movies. And there is some representation of a coat of plates in the movie Braveheart on the Scottish side. Now, it's not done exactly right, but 
it's closer to what a coat of plates would look like than what the British are wearing. And a coat of plates is kind of a vest or harness of fabric that has metal sewn into it. And this would have been, in the early periods, it was worn underneath the mail. During this time period, it probably would have been worn over the mail. And we'll, we'll take William Wallace's armor that he wears in the movie to kind of compare it. Now, William Wallace, or Mel Gibson's armor in the movie is kind of a coat of plates. It's a leather shirt, and you can kind of see that there's those little squares of metal sewn into it. That would is kind of like a coat of plates, although it's wrong as well. There's too many gaps. They're too far spaced. There's not enough of them. It wasn't, it, 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 it wasn't like that, but it's closer than what the British are wearing. When you look at historical representations of the coat of plates, they're much bigger plates and they're covering the important areas to prevent gaps. So when you see these metal plates and they're lined up to each other and you can kind of see the seam in between them, those are all spots that where a point of a sword or the edge of an axe or the point of a spear will go into. And with the pressure, even if the point of one of those weapons hits directly in the middle of one of those little square plates, it's going to slide and find that gap and then go into the person's body. And none of the Scots are wearing mail, and almost all of them would have been wearing some form of mail during this time period. The Scots, like we said in the episode, weren't Dark Age barbarians. They wouldn't have been covered in mud. We obviously know they wouldn't have been wearing kilts, but we're talking about the armor specifically. So that's why I say William Wallace's armor in the movie is more like what a medieval traditional coat of plates would look like, but it's still completely wrong. There's tombs depicting coat of plates. There's art depicting coat of plates. You see it in German art, you see it in French art, and you see it in some English art. There's descriptions of it throughout the medieval world referring to some kings and and some armies wearing it. And they they I feel like the people in the movie heard coat the words coat of plates and then imagined what that would be and created a Scottish version and a British version. And in doing that, they missed it completely. The coat of plates is a super cool transitional piece of armor coming from the world of mail to the world of plate armor. And it would have been really cool to see a depiction of coat of plates in this movie. And it would have given the movie a much more real feel of authenticity from a historical weapons and armor perspective. Now, the story itself obviously has tons and tons of, of problems, but... When you look at them, when you when I say them, I mean the the soldiers in general in the movie. They're not wearing enough layers. They're not wearing the correct pieces. They're not they're not doing anything right. They're not doing anything right. Now the weapons themselves, overall, the swords and the spears, are more or less correct. I don't have that big of a problem with the weapons that they use. You know. More or less, it's more with the armor and how they wear it, the helmets that they're using. The it, it's just all it's all wrong. This this late 1200s, early 1300s is kind of known as a transitional period of armor. So you'll see people in just mail, and you'll start to see these coat of plates, and, or the coat of plates is well established by the 1290s. And coming into the 1300s, you start to see actual plate armor. So you would have seen some of those transitional pieces kind of along the, you know, like leg armors, like shin armor and um, arm and shoulders. And, And they do have some of that in the movie, but even that just... It just kind of looks wrong. The helmets, some of the helmets are correct. You see the Great Helm, which is worn specifically by Robert the Bruce when he's on the side of Longshanks during the Battle of Falkirk. You know, that kind of, it's kind of squarish. It's big. That's called the Great Helm. And that was coming into into its own during this time period. So that itself is historically accurate. But everything else that they're wearing is wrong. They've got the the plate armor jumpsuits and then they put a surcoat over it with the Longshanks lions on it and it's like boom okay these are all the British and 
the Scots get leather armor and kilts. Now, leather armor itself, we'll talk about that for a little bit. Throughout history, there has been almost no evidence of leather armor at all the way it's portrayed in movies. When you see leather armor in movies, it is a bad, you know, LARPing representation of what leather armor looked like. Now, there is historical records of boiled leather and leather armor of a certain type, but we don't exactly know what the process was. When you take leather and you boil it, it does become harder and tougher, but it also becomes much more brittle. And people back then would have known this, and they wouldn't have used leather armor the way it's portrayed. And the, the way it's portrayed in, in movies, it's not even boiled. It's just leather that's been sewn together to look as close to metal armor as possible. It would have offered almost zero protection whatsoever. Now, we don't know the medieval and, and even ancient you know, boiling leather process. There's been some people who have come up with theories and done tests to things to try and recreate what we think boiled leather could be and if there's like some type of ancient glue that's been used or horn resin, th things like that. But just having leather itself with nothing else is not going to protect you. So anytime you see someone wearing a leather helmet or a leather cuirass or a leather breastplate, and not just in Braveheart, but in any movie, it's wrong. It doesn't matter what time period, it's all wrong. The, pe the people were not wearing leather armor. I mean, that is a cosplay representation that people have got from the, you know, the ninja store in the mall type of armor. It's bad. So, I feel like that covers the armor pretty well, and now we'll move on to some of the battle and the tactics. When, and I did hit these fairly hard in the episode, but we're going to talk a little bit more about it. When we, we'll look at the Battle of Sterling first. When I watched movies, and when I was younger and I watched movies, I just kind of assumed that ancient battles were like this. Everyone lines up on the open field. You know, you've got your army on one side, we've got our army on the other, and now we charge and we fight until every single person on one side or the other is dead. No one um, from that side survives. We kill everybody. And if anyone does survive, it's like the one guy, they ceremoniously go to spread the word, you know, to the other villages that this army's been conquered and now you're our subjects, kind of a thing. That's a little bit blown up proportion, but that's kind of what you see, especially in Braveheart. You know, when at that Battle of Sterling in the movie... There are zero British that survive that. And that's just not the way ancient battles and even medieval battles were. Even battles today. You know, there's, the casualties on the side of, you know, kind of medieval warfare are m always much, much lower than you would think, especially when you see the sizes of the army. A lot of that has to do with the armor technology and it getting better and better. But it also has to do with soldiers' psyche and people not wanting to just smash into each other all the time and fight to the death. You know, and, and people and historians have gone back and looked at this. Okay, when they say this, do they mean this? And and did they really smash into each other, or do they kind of just line up and kind of poke and prod at each other until one side routes, and then that's when a lot of the killing happens, when the cavalry can run down people and, and things of that nature. So it's just a bad representation via Hollywood to try and make it more dramatic and make the battles bigger and things of that. But talking about the Battle of Sterling specifically, in the movie, it, there's no bridge at all. And the Battle of Sterling is called the Battle of Sterling Bridge for a reason. It was fought on a bridge. It was fought for this bridge. They were crossing the river. I honestly think that the historical battle of Sterling Bridge is much more dramatic than this big open field battle. It it allows us to see the kind of battlefield tactics of both sides and the kind of chess game that's played between these two sides leading up to when these battles happen. They didn't just say, hey, on Tuesday, meet at the green field so we can decide who's going to be in charge of Scotland. You know, it's a whole campaign, and they're vying for position, and should we cross, shouldn't we cross, is this the right place, all of that. The Scottish realizing that uh, they can't take the English army on all at once, so they're going to let part of them cross the bridge, cut off that part, kill it, and then 
start pushing across the bridge and under the weight of the English, it collapses and they kill a lot more, a lot more English. And then they kind of track the English retreating army back and kind of pick them off and, and kill them in the retreat that way. I just think that that's a very cool battle. It's a very cool battle in Scottish history. It's a very cool battle in all of history. And the movie just completely throws it aside and and does another stereotypical open field charge. We smash into each other and we kill everybody until we're the we're the victors. When you look at the end of that battle and it pans across the field, there's like 20 Scots left and then everyone else is dead. I mean, if 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 battles were fought like that, no nation would be able to sustain a campaign. One battle would end it for both sides, whether you won or lost. And now there are battles in history where those types of things happen for sure but as a general rule of thumb that's not how battles were and it's not how this battle was now we get to the battle of falkirk and once again it's another open field battle and we charge in now the thing that they you know i talked about this in the episode the thing with the battle of falkirk is the Skilltrons, the hedgehog formations that the Scottish put their infantry and then their archers in the middle. And they kind of try and recreate this in the movie at the first battle when the cavalry charged them. And it, I don't know why they just didn't, you know, I don't know. I just don't know. Uh, the Battle of Falkirk is another super unique battle when you've got the Scottish in these Skilltrons and the British cavalry trying to penetrate and prod and find laps, uh, loops into the um, formations and they can't do it. They route off the Scottish cavalry and disperse some of the archers and then the first instance where you see really the English with the Welsh longbow doing severe damage to an army at this battle. It's a historical watershed moment for medieval warfare and English warfare specifically because this is when the English are going to realize the power of the longbow and starting to incorporate it not only into their military but their culture. And this is kind of where they realize that and begin to use it to its fullest extent and then moving forward they use it even even more. That's a super cool battle. I I don't get if you're looking to try and make these two battles different you know this and and they choose the spears in the first one and they choose kind of like the oil and the fire in the second one why not have the bridge and the skilltrons that's a much cooler way that's also historically accurate to portray these battles as unique battles and to you know this the budget on this movie's massive they could have done these things and portrayed it historically accurate from a military standpoint and Still made it look super cool. It just, I don't understand why Hollywood thinks that all we want to see as a dumb, stupid audience is army line up and charge into each other. I think Hollywood thinks that the masses are dumb, they know better, and they they get it all wrong, and it's a copycat, it's a copycat battle throughout a, a ton of movies. Now, as we get more closer to today's date, movies have begun to do a little bit more research, and there are certain movies that get battles a little bit more historically accurate. But for a long time, and still as you know, as a general rule of thumb, these battles are just like, okay, well, we can't make it too complicated because people won't understand. We'll just have them line up on the field and charge each other, and it will be the Scots in kilts and the British wearing red. You know, it's just, it's, it's kind of insulting uh, to a certain degree. And if you had just spent a little time researching what the battles were and said, hey, you know what, we're going to do this, but we can kind of crank it up to 11, you know, and make the battle a little bit bigger, more dramatic, and still keep that historical representation, that historical core that's still there, it would have been a much stronger scene, in my opinion. And anyways, those are just some of my thoughts on the weapons, armor, and uh, tactics from the Scottish War of Independence and the movie Braveheart. And um, and yeah, so the, if people like this and I get some good feedback, we'll move on to the next one. We'll move on to Tombstone and we'll talk about some of the guns and tactics and things like that involved during that time period and in the movie. And then we'll just kind of catch up to where we are on the full episodes. And then as more full episodes are produced, I'll come out with these kind of uh, based on history minis involving around the weapons and, and tactics. So... 
I hope everyone's doing well. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Follow us on Spotify. Follow us on Instagram. Help out. Help us out building the brand. All right. I'll see y'all next time. Adios.